Welcome to Trinity United Church. Today's service is the fourth after Epiphany. It's uh, January 31st, or 20, I almost said 1921. It's 2021 and uh, a year that we hope is unfolding in a more positive manner uh, soon to come than 2020 did. Um, I welcome you to Trinity United Church. We strive to be a safe community for all, regardless of race, creed, age, cultural background, religious affiliation, sexual orientation, or gender identification. Here, we're all invited guests of God. And we acknowledge that for many thousands of years, the indigenous people of Turtle Island walked this land. We are thankful to share in the special spirit of this place, rich in the energy of Mother Earth and the love of all creation. I'll light our Christ candle and uh, we'll sing the, uh, the first verse to hymn 78, Sing Till Sundown. Sing till sundown, hum your joy, dress in starlight, girl and boy, man and woman, climb the hill, warmed beyond December's chill, reeling clapping, touch the Well, welcome back to uh, Catherine Colantonio, who uh, <clears throat> is back singing the hymns with us. Uh, we've got one for more voices, just one for more voices, correct, today? And then the other two are from uh, Voices United. This is, uh, as I said, the 31st of January, and uh, hopefully by now the Leafs are uh, solidly in first place. Um, when, uh, <laughs> when we're broadcasting this, I think they're three and two. They're doing okay, but uh, I must be out of practice as well watching hockey games. I can hardly get through them without falling asleep. And uh, as I think I've said before, the ads are killing me after watching Netflix for so long. To sit through one more truck ad is uh, crazy. Anyway, uh, I invite you as well. We are starting our book study next week. It's The Great Emergence, How Christianity is Changing and Why by a, a woman with a delightful name, Phyllis Tickle. And uh, it's, a, it's not a very thick book, but it's a, it's a thought-provoking book. And uh, um, so if you'd like to be part of that, let me know, and I can either direct you to an online uh, way of downloading the book um, by uh, Kindle, uh, or perhaps uh, arrange a way for you to read the book and be with us. It's Tuesday afternoons at uh, 1 to 3, uh, sorry, 1.30 to 3, um, starting the first week in February. We're also doing a uh, Lenten study in the evenings uh, later in February, and we're using resource from the United Church uh, Resource Center. So if you'd like to be part of that, let me know. Uh, John Brown sent an announcement out, and you'll probably have received another one <clears throat> by, uh, by then as well. Um, so I'd like to, uh, as I say, uh, welcome everyone to this time, and hopefully the winter news is good, and uh, uh, Pfizer's back on, online, and we've got uh, good news coming. And so we continue our, uh, our service with an opening prayer. And I don't have the, uh, I didn't write this prayer. I certainly used it from somewhere else and changed. I certainly added my own to it, but I don't have the uh, author of this prayer. Beloved God, you enfold all creation with possibility and future. You are the God of cold nights and brittle days, the warming hearth that beckons while winds blow and water is sealed by ice. You are the God of shimmering northern lights that dance across the sky in festive celebration. You are the one who gives us the way of Christ, life giver, church maker, community grower, healer, abiding light. In you we find our eternal life and full health. Amen. This is, uh, do we know this uh, hymn? I don't know if you guys are mic'd, but it's a new one. It's a new one. Good, it's good for us. So we're going to sing... Uh, uh, 171, for more voices, Christ has no body now but yours. Soothe all its suffering. 
I'm reading from the, uh, <clears throat> the Older Testament this morning. The first reading is from the book of Deuteronomy. It's, uh, I challenge you to spell that without looking it up. And uh, it's a, a book, Deuteronomy um, can be interpreted as the book of law. And it's actually, it's, a, it's part of the uh, important uh, uh, covenant Moses makes uh, um, with uh, the people of Israel speaking uh, for God um, about how they are to live as people of God. And in this passage, um, if you read the whole book, I think there's 31 chapters to it. I think it's 31, something like that. Um, It's a a long, long speech. And what he's giving, Moses is giving the people, uh, he's literally laying down the law. So it's got all of the... uh, the aspects of uh, uh, how to cook, how to eat, um, how to what to wear, and so on. It's uh, as one one author uh, wrote in the it's 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 a it's almost a satirical book. Well, it is a satirical book about a year of living biblically. Um, he followed, tried to follow the book of Deuteronomy and uh, reconcile it with the book of Leviticus. And the, the laws laid down in one contradict the laws laid down in another, and so on. So it's, uh, it's certainly a book that's important to the Hebrew people, but it's, uh, as all the scriptures, and this is part of Torah's first five books, um, it's uh, open to debate, so how they interpret the law of land. In this passage, and it's interesting, uh, as I prepare to retire, and I do not cast myself as a Messiah figure, a Moses figure, or anyone like that. So it's presumptuous of me to say that, even to offer it. But the people are, are realizing, and uh, Moses is telling them, that he can't go any further with them. And he's telling them about his own death to come. And he has led them through the, uh, the long exodus and so on. And they are about to reach the promised land. And so they're going to be able to see it on the other side of the Jordan, and as we talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago, the River Jordan isn't that wide, but Moses isn't allowed to cross the River Jordan and join with the people in the Promised Land. So this is his uh, farewell speech, his uh, swan song, if you will. It goes on for 31 uh, chapters, and it touches every aspect of how they are to live in the settled new place. Um, it's one way to live on the road, um, another when they reach the Promised Land. And uh, so he's assuring them that their leadership will come from within God's call. And so in this passage, uh, Deuteronomy 18, I think it's 15 to 20, this passage, um, he's assuring them that what comes next uh, will be from God. But he also puts um, the challenge in front of them um, that they need to make sure, and he doesn't exactly say how they're going to make sure, that the one that speaks for God is actually from God, or the word of God is being purely spoken and not being uh, um, put on the lips of someone who's a a false messiah, if you will, or a false leader. So he assures them that someone's coming, which will be Joshua, um, but um, he can't go with them. Listen now to the story. The Lord your God will rise, raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore or ever again, see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, you are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything I command. Anyone who does not heed the words of the prophet shall speak in my name. I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet will die. You may say to yourself, How can we recognize a word that the Lord has not spoken? If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove too true, it is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Do not be frightened by it. Amen.
I think Paul's going to speak about the next hymn, uh, 620, Silence, Frenzied, Unclean Spirit. Yes, Brian, thank you, and uh, good morning. This is a very interesting hymn, uh, and, uh, and it, uh, it requires or calls for, I think, uh, setting the stage to sing it and to understand it and listen to it. You might remember that last week I talked about how uh, one of the things that's captured the interest of modern hymn writers is to look at Bible stories and put them to music. And uh, we talked about that last week with the, the hymn we sang that featured the story of Zacchaeus and the widow with the pennies and the, um, uh, I can't remember the third verse of that particular hymn, but told the story, oh, the, 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 uh, the uh, harvest, the grape harvesters and how those who, were, who came late to the party were late to the job actually were uh, paid just as much as those that spent the whole day working. But this hymn today, takes another biblical passage uh, story of, uh, of the casting out of the demons, which Brian's going to read later, or perhaps Catherine, in the service uh, from the book of Mark, uh, where Jesus went to, was in the synagogue and he cast out the demons. And uh, again, not, a, not necessarily a story that would lend itself easily to, uh, to music, but the composer, whose name is Thomas Traeger, uh, 1984, he wrote this hymn, Thomas Traeger was an ordained uh, Presbyterian and Episcopal, Episcopal uh, minister in the United States, and he eventually became a professor at uh, Yale University in pastoral care. And he wrote the words, and what he did, which is really quite interesting, is he, he paraphrased, but didn't paraphrase very much. He took it pretty directly from, from a, a translation of Scripture. And uh, he, he set the hymn up with that as the first verse. And the second verse, he, he moved into what I would refer to as the modern human condition, where we in our own world uh, experience the presence of evil, if you will, and, and uh, the notion that uh, we, we are uh, prey to so many things that uh, take us off the beaten path, so to speak, and trouble us and, and challenge us as, as we live our lives. And then the third verse is, the, is, is talking about the restorative power and the redemptive power of uh, faith in Christ and so on. So first verse, frenzied, uh, sorry, silence, Christ said, frenzied, unclean spirit. Cease your ranting, flesh can't bear it, flee as night before the sun. And the demon left the, the individual that uh, Christ was, was speaking to and the congregation was was. Uh, completely overwhelmed, and, and, uh, and such was the fame that uh, Christ began uh, in, in his ministry. Second verse, as I mentioned, talks about the here and now. Um, Lord, the demons still are thriving in the gray cells of the mind, tyrant voices, shrill and driving, twisted thoughts that grip and bind, doubts that stir the hearts to panic, fears distorting reason's sight. So, the, the very things that, uh, that we experience in our day-to-day -day human existence. Third verse, silence, Lord, the unclean spirit in our mind and in our heart. Speak your word that when we hear it, all our demons shall depart. So again, that sense of healing, that sense of redemptive power, and, and, and the, the triumph, if you will, if you will of overcoming and, and dealing with those things that challenge us. Those are the words. But here's what's really interesting. The woman who set these words to music, a woman by the name of Carol Doran, who was a, 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 a church a musician uh, and became a professor at Colgate Rochester uh, University uh, in, in uh, pastoral music, or, or sacred music, I should say. She specifically wrote this hymn to line up with these words. And you may remember back in the spring, I talked a little bit about the elements of music uh, texture and dynamic and tone and, and rhythm and harmony and melody. And this piece features melody, but it's prominently showcasing harmony. So I, I want you to think of what kind of sounds would the composer associate with words such as silence, frenzied, unclean spirit, cease your ranting, well, this is what the composer has done. The melody is fairly straightforward. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But listen to the harmony 
not necessarily pleasant sounds like this might be. Nice, happy tune, which is supported with pleasing harmony, as opposed to. Those are not happy sounds. They bite, they, they create that sense of tension and, and uh, an image of that notion of frenzied, unclean spirits, cease your ranting, Flee as night before the sun. Okay, so the melody now, unlike most melodies that have a movement from one note to the other, this has a number of repeated notes. So if you were counting, the first note of the hymn was repeated 13 times. What does that signify? It signifies the resoluteness of Christ's command. Very deliberate, very focused. Silence, frenzied spirit, cried God's healing one. Cleanse your ranting. So that sense of resoluteness, that forceful power, that repeated note, insists insists on that, that notion of out demon. The next part of the hymn, though, the melody, is very different. So almost dance-like. Now, it's a three-verse hymn. At the very end, there's that sense of peaceful resolution which you'll hear in the harmony. Whereas verse one and two end like this. In the last verse, ends like this. So that sense of completeness, of oneness that is brought forth through that sense of uh, harmonic resolution after the clash of sounds that we hear. Clash of sounds that we hear earlier in the piece. So a very, very effective marriage of words and the music carries the message of those words. So we're going to sing this hymn now and, and uh, I know that Kath, uh, Kath, Catherine and I have worked through this. So she will be doing her best to convey that notion of chaos and, and darkness and, and um, th that, that sense of challenge that we experience and, and troubled spirit and then as it moves to resolution in the third verse.
first reading today is uh, the epistle 1 Corinthians 8, chapter verses 1 to 13. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when, when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The second reading is Mark uh, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. Jesus drives out an impure spirit. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Je Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Amen. <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> Let's join in prayer. <laughs> Oh God, help us read your word and always, always find the joy which you intend for us to read it together and discern your way and your laws within us. Help us uh, learn to sing your song and to sing your truth in many ways, in new hymns, and new authors, and music that's discordant. Help us always find a way through and a way to hold your truth that calls us to who we are. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, have you heard of the keto diet? It's, uh, if you haven't, uh, I can tell you, you probably will. It's a, a diet that's certainly become all the rage. I see in the stores, it's uh, not unlike the, uh, the Schuldeis diet. Um, when they used to, uh, when, hernia, when you had to go for a hernia, you had to send your weight down to the Schuldeis clinic. And if you weighed too much, they send you back the diet, and that's what you had to eat. And it's a, it's a wonderful diet. You get to eat bacon with butter all over it. You get to eat all you want to eat, any fat you want on top of your, your steaks. You can slather it up. If you're, uh, I think, in the, uh, the bodybuilding world, uh, people that we have um, in, our, uh, in our companionship, um, <clears throat> in the community who have become bodybuilders and so on, they would follow much the same as the keto diet. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful way of getting energy. You feel energized and you lose weight, even though you're eating uh, all what uh, you may have thought previously were all the wrong things. Your cholesterol, I think, goes through the roof. And there's other, other certainly, uh, repercussions uh, <clears throat> with the, uh, the, the, the level of protein that you consume. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, the other thing that comes with the keto diet 
is zealousness. If you've met someone who's on the keto diet, they're going to tell you all about it. When I was on the keto diet, I talked about it all the time. I tried to get my friends to go to the keto diet. It's a, it's a, it's a way of uh, uh, feeling like you've converted to something and you want all your friends to do the same. It's interesting in the uh, passage from uh, Paul uh, was, is writing about food and fu food in the early church is uh, much the same subject of uh, discussion as in our day. Uh, since I'm not on the keto diet um, and food is, uh, we judge each other by what we eat and how we eat. And uh, I was in the grocery store uh, a couple weeks ago and I was walking through and uh, I had grabbed a, a bag of uh, Miss Vicky's uh, potato chips. So <laughs> I love Miss Vicky's potato chips. I put it in my cart and I was pushing down the aisle and coming the other way and she hadn't yet seen me yet was uh, one of the uh, really, well, she's a health nut, if you will. <laughs> and her, her whole cart was filled with uh, vegetables and all kinds of the whole foods. Mine was pretty good, but anyway, I took the keto chips and I put them under the bags that I had to pack out so she wouldn't see them. Afterwards, I thought, this is crazy. But don't kid yourself, we do judge each other by the foods we eat. And we are so often judgmental in so many other ways. Uh, Paul was writing about the early church in which uh, the purity laws, <clears throat> and it's interesting because in the book of Deuteronomy, it talks a lot about the foods people can eat and the purity laws and so on, and how to eat the right foods and how to consume, how to cook them. It is uh, uh, very much like our time, I think, very consumed with uh, right eating. Um, but with that can come, and I think uh, my hiding the bag of chips under a uh, grocery bag, what comes uh, often when you start to become zealous like that is uh, strong judgments as well. And so we start to cast uh, the idea, and uh, although the keto isn't a church, uh, the, the church certainly knows its own uh, history of uh, believing itself to be pure and clean, and it is uh, a strong aspect of our church, uh, churches, uh, faith communities, in particular those who are strongly convinced that they have now got the right way to cast uh, strong judgments on others. And it's, uh, I think it, it's, it'd be fair to say that a strong feature of the, pe the reason people don't want to be part of the church is because they either be felt judged or feel like they will be judged. I've had lots of my friends say, well, I could never walk into your church, it would fall down. In other words, I would be so strongly judged as unsuitable for the church um, that I shouldn't go in there. Well, I've often said to those same people, you think the church that would have me for a minister would throw you out? It's, uh, I think that uh, the reason I'm part of this church is because we are and we practice and we strongly, we're certainly not perfect. We're certainly not perfect. But I think we practice an openness <clears throat> that is in strong keeping with the practice and the hopes of the first uh, disciples and the Jesus movement, as I understand it. As I've said before, Jesus was accused of eating with sinners and being a wine bibbler, um, in other words, practicing unpure practices, and by way of his uh, table manners and by way of his associates, uh, he was judged by the church of his day to be unsuitable and sinning uh, according to the law um, and in his interpretation, not the spirit of God. The United Church, uh, and I've been told by people who are not part of this church, and uh, I, I, one of my friends was uh, in the UCW here, was talking to me about a story. Um, they were going to a uh, prayer session, and the idea that the United Church actually isn't even Christian is uh, strongly held by uh, a number of people who uh, are part of the wider church. It's, it's a, sad, uh, a sad thing to say, but I've heard that from people, and they say, well, you're not even really a church. You ordain uh, uh, gay people, you baptize anyone that comes to the door, you'll perform marriages and funerals for people who aren't part of the church. Um, Bill Phipps uh, caused a national controversy as a moderator of the church when he talked about how we understand the divinity of Jesus isn't literal, but is a, uh, uh, certainly a serious consideration in our creeds. We don't say the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, and so on. We practice, and it may sound like I'm, uh, I'm trumpeting um, this church, and I guess, I guess in a certain way I am, 
But we practice, uh, I, I think, uh, a necessary openness that's upsetting, especially to those who want to establish lines and boundaries around faith and God and the church. It's as I read the stories of Jesus, and it's uh, so interesting, uh, Vatican II, uh, in the 60s, the Pope, uh, Pope John, it was Pope John, I think, uh, said that the church needs to open its windows and let the air in, let the light in, let new ideas in. It's uh, been a struggle for the past 50 or 60 years for the Catholic Church, although I think there's certainly been important uh, movements and reforms, uh, I would say, uh, like all churches, uh, ours included, of course, there's still a long way to go. But it's the practice of Jesus, to me, um, he was first and foremost about healing the church. And the church doesn't necessarily like to hear that because we like to think of ourselves as pure, as uh, uh, people who have uh, got the faith and are protected. Um, but I would say that uh, often the sickness of uh, the church is one we ignore at our peril. Um, you might call it a demon or unwellness, and the demons that I believe Jesus was casting out first and foremost um, was from the church itself or herself or itself. That the demons, and this first story we encounter in Mark, the demon they encountered was within the church itself. That's where it happens. Jesus names the name, and uh, in, the, in the beginning of his ministry, people were awed, but they weren't awed for that long. They soon became angry with his healing practices and his ministries. I think when uh, we know, uh, I, and, and I, I run the risk here of, uh, of uh, speaking uh, strongly criticism against other churches, and I, I guess that's the risk I'm willing to run, that when we close our doors, when we close our minds, when we close our thoughts, um, that's when the darkness and uh, I'm also aware that the darkness is a charged term. That's when the darkness finds a place. When we look at the uh, residential schools, when we look at the, uh, um, the sexual abuse of children and women, people who are vulnerable within the church, uh, especially the clergy who have who practiced and visited these horrible acts upon people, people knew. People knew what was going on. But it was a chosen blindness and it was to protect the demons within the church that wrought such havoc and pain upon so many people. It was the unwillingness of the church herself to face her own demons that in, in, my, uh, in my faith uh, led to the ending of Jesus' life, his uh, human story. And it was the church in the end that couldn't stand the sight he was bringing and the reformation. In our, in our church, in the church I've served, and again, I don't say it's perfect, um, we are endeavoring to do that in many ways. And it's interesting because even symbolically, so the church is now in the minister's office, uh, it has a window. Um, there are windows in places that used to be closed doors. And it's, it's a way of letting the light in and saying, you can't keep secrecy here because secrets lead to wounding. And secrets and self-righteousness can lead to pain and even death. As uh, Paul was talking about that, uh, that hymn we just sang, um, the, uh, the discord, when we get to uh, the uh, Holy Week, which is leading, leads up to Good Friday and uh, um, hopefully Easter, um, but it's that discordant movement uh, music that I hear so strongly that what's happened is the demons that Jesus has faced and cast out haven't gone away, but they gather as a strong force of murderous intent to silence him and to stop the opening of God's word. To me, that's uh, what fundamentalism at its worst is, to block out and border in a way that Christ never did. It's that naming, and I guess uh, like the emperor's clothes, it's the little boy that says, you guys know it, that he's naked, eh? It's the naming of the truth that we have that is the most dangerous. And it could have gone either way for the little boy in the story of the emperor. In the story of Jesus, his naming went the sad way, and the, uh, the death um, was largely led by people who didn't want to open up 
God's word to those outside. And I'm not, again, I know I'm at the risk of casting stones at uh, other traditions, but I think a careful reading and an open heart reading of the story would lend this to be a credible, credible suggestion. It's uh, that which Jesus makes unpopular is God's word is, ac- is accessible and open. And it's that opening of thoughts and mind and growth and the idea that God isn't a, a God that stopped talking, a God that stopped, stopped being with us. It's, it's an attempt to open and let the light and word of God in. And that's the most dangerous, dangerous practice in a tradition that defies and tries to stop that from happening. The demons that he was facing are the demons we have. And we have, and it's, uh, it's certainly not bound to tradition as the second verse of that hymn went. It's in the gray matter of ourselves, it's in our brains, it's in our hearts, and that's, that's the place of the demon that Jesus was attempting to exorcise. And that the waters of baptism, as uh, one writer said, to join with Jesus in the waters of baptism isn't a private beach for the rich and famous. It's a place where we find our place at the table and in the pool and in the well, if you will, the living water with Christ. The demons that he calls out are dangerous once loosed. And they require all of us as a church to hold the light together and to practice our wellness as reformed, as people of repentance, and people who have been relifed by God. With the shriek, the demons comes out. The question is, where does it go next? And I guess that's up for us. The good folk who follow Christ, and uh, sometimes it's me and sometimes it isn't, to practice a light and a wellness that he brought. In the name of Christ, that which lifts us up and changes us from the inside. Amen. I invite you to join with me in prayer. We pray with our uh, eyes and our hearts and our doors wide open. Uh, Certainly in this uh, time of uh, COVID, we can't uh, join in person here, but I trust that uh, we are finding our way to be God's church in uh, new ways. And it's actually interesting because uh, as we emerge from this time, we are learning new skills and new practices, uh, even in our our service of each other within the church. Um, This comes, although it feels right now like a heavy heavy, uh, curse upon us, um, there will be goodness come out of this time things we haven't even yet imagined. And uh, let that be our pastoral prayer, that although we've traveled together through this darkness and the dark, darkening times, that out of this will come an Easter story and resurrection, if you will, if we are willing to let it grow within us. In the name of all that's holy, we pray, and we sing together the Lord's Prayer using hymn two 959 in Voices United. We invite and acknowledge uh, people as we're offering and uh, 
We're moving up to a, a time of year when we usually have our AGM and we look at the uh, year that's gone past and how we, uh, and, and it's largely when you read the annual report, it's what we did as a way of offering and a way of practice of ministry. In many, many permutations, this year's annual report is going to look quite different uh, than it has for a hundred and whatever years we've been here. Um, but at its heart is uh, still the story of how we give as a people and how we receive the Word of God and the practice of God in all our ministries. We ask God to bless us with the uh, hearts that are courageous and a church that really does make a difference in the lives of creation. In the name of Christ and all that's holy, we pray and we give and we are all that we are. Amen. Our last hymn is 619, Healer of Our Every Ill. before we started that hymn. By the end, I'm sure you did know it. <laughs> Catherine, uh, as we said in last week's service, is moving to Kingston, and she's going to be part of this congregation uh, online, and uh, perhaps coming back in person uh, when she's back around in the, uh, in the summer, I guess, yep. perhaps. Um, anyway, I just would like to acknowledge her, uh, the ministries that she's offered here, and say once again just how much we've appreciated and how much we love Very her uh, laugh and smile. And <laughs> you, you are really you. Are a dear part of this church. So our benediction is, may the God of hope go with us. May the God of hope go with you. Thank you. May the God, God of hope go with, with us every day. day.
that's new. 